Good morning. Welcome all viewers on behalf of World Vegan Vision and to our Meet the Author segment. I'm Devashree Parikh. Today we are going to meet the recipient of Henry Spira Grassroots Animal Activist Award winner and the author of today's book, Homo Ahimsa, Judy McCoy Carmen. We are so thrilled to have her with us today. Along with her, we have our very own Dr. Shanik Shah and Avinash Kachi. Judy Carmen is celebrated earth peace and animal activist and author of several books like Peace to All Beings, The Missing Peace, and now her latest new book is Homo Ahimsa, who we really are, who we are, how we are going to save the world. And it's a very interesting book. She's very actively involved in animal rescue work. She's currently working on Animals Peace Prayer Flag Project. She conducts vegan spirituality interviews and retreats, very, very busy in the field. She's co-founding Animal Outreach of Kansas, the Circle of Compassion, and Prayer Circle for Animals and Interfaith Vegan Coalition. Welcome, Judy. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here in, in this uh, rarefied yes. atmosphere with you all. I'm so, so excited to be here. Yeah, I Thank was, you. Uh, welcome. So I was reading your book and while on my vacation last week, and what a coincidence. Walking on the beach, I found unusually large amount of drifted bleached corals while snorkeling. I love snorkeling and I was going on my snorkeling trip and I have done that in the past and I could see so many corals and this time everything was gray. 90% coral reefs were gone. I was too disturbed. And I finished my book on the beach and it was mind boggling to go through your book and finish the book. Love the title of your book and can't wait to share what is in the book. And I think would love to hear from you. Uh, that would be the right perspective. Uh, love your title, uh, Homo Ahimsa. Uh, the word has embedded in my soul for since childhood, growing up in India, in our centuries, old scriptures have always talked about Ahimsa, nonviolence, no harm to other living beings. And I find it very idealistic and innovative proposition by you. You have made throughout Ahimsa. It's a exceptionally um, innovative approach of veganism and Ahimsa. So I hope that we'll will attain in some day, maybe in a few centuries, um, and this fresh approach of yours will go through a lot of our viewers' mind and will be life changer. So Judy, please walk us through your book and what inspired to write, to write this book and how you landed this approach, more importantly. So please share. Okay, thank you so much. Um, well, I love the word ahimsa. Of course, I didn't know it in childhood. I grew up in Kansas and my dad was a hunter and you know we ate uh, the standard American diet here. <laughs> Uh, I'd never heard of vegetarians even. So um, when I learned the word ahimsa, I was uh, mainly studying Gandhi and uh, he took that vow and uh, was uh, a very um, uh, life-changing concept to me to think that there were people in the world who not only uh, embraced that idea but took that vow. And, and then as I was uh, learning to become vegan, I realized that, boy, this is all, this all works together so perfectly. And uh, so in my book, Peace to All Beings, uh, the subtitle of that is Veggie Soup for the Chicken Soul, which is kind of a play on the other <laughs> the other soul books <laughs> many of them were about chicken soup 
for souls. And I, I felt like I needed to say something about that. But anyway, um, I coined the term at that time. This was in the early 2000s. And my thinking was homo sapiens has really messed things up in this world and, and in general. And even though sapiens means wise, uh, we didn't really show that very well by, by our <laughs> actions. And what you're talking about, uh, about the, the bleached coral and what's happening to the world everywhere in the environment and to the animals is it's heartbreaking. And so to me, thinking uh, the way, the way uh, Buckminster Fuller talks about it, you can't solve problems by using the same techniques that you use to create the problems in the first place. And so I'm thinking, well, let's, let's just be a different, a different species almost if we're gonna solve the problems that Homo sapiens has caused. And, and then it just made sense. We need to be Homo ahimsa, not Homo sapiens. And it brought uh, Latin and Sanskrit together, which I really liked that idea. And um, Silish Rao kind of picked that up. I, you all know Silish, I think. Um, the, he has the Climate Healers and uh, the Vegan World 2026. Uh, his goal is to create a vegan world by 2026. And his thinking is that we, that's about how much time we have because we're doing so much destruction so quickly. <clears throat> and it's, it's um, escalating exponentially uh, with all the technology that we have now and the the huge earth moving things and the drilling and the mining and all of the destruction to the oceans and the land, as you all, as you pointed out, it's, um, really heartbreaking. So I start out my book, <clears throat> Homo Ahimsa, this is, well, wait, let me back up a little bit. I, I came up with the idea of it in my first book, Peace to All Beings, in the early uh, 2000s. And so I was, you know, kind of going off of that and talking to people about that. And uh, of course, talking about veganism and uh, all these other things I've been involved in. And, uh, but things kept getting worse. And, you know, as activists, we, wa we wanna believe that what we're doing is making a difference, is that making things better and creating solutions to all these things. And while we're seeing a lot of that happening, we're also seeing this rush towards extinction of, of so many animals and, and the tremendous desertification that's going on and all the, the trees that are being cut down just to grow feed for farmed animals that people are going to eat, which makes no sense. It's so inefficient. And also to graze animals. And this is just keeps escalating, keeps escalating. And so I thought, you know, I have to write another book and just call it Homo Ahimsa and say, this is who we really are. You know, let's quit being Homo sapiens and destroying the earth and let's be who we really are, which is Homo ahimsa, the, the kind, loving, nonviolent creature that can heal the earth, heal the damage that Homo sapiens has done. And largely that has to do with changing our mindset, not really so much changing it as awakening to the truth within ourselves, which is to be kind and loving. And so, um, so I start out the book, my, the part one, there's two parts. One part is why do we need to do this? Why do we need to become homo ahimsa, awakened to our inner nature of truth and love? And the second is how, how are we gonna do it? So uh, why um, is uh, described as why we must rise above homo sapiens and transcend to our higher nature and our spiritual destiny 
now because we're running out of time. And so that that part of the book is uh, has some very dark stuff in it as far as what we have done to the earth in the last 10,000 years since um, animal agriculture started, basically. Animal agriculture, wars, and pandemics all kind of started at the same time. They're all linked together because they all have to do with this dominator mindset that came into humanity's consciousness and for whomever, we don't know why, but it did. Um, and then, so part two is how, how to transcend to our true nature as homo ahimsa, let go of the dominator worldview and live in partnership, reverence, nonviolence, and gratitude with all life. So, so that's basically um, the gist of the book. And my goal is in this is to help everyone see that we can do this. We don't have a lot of time, part one, but we can do it, part two, if we recognize who we really are. And I think um, I've, I've heard a lot of people uh, do this, ask someone, would you intentionally harm an animal? You very rarely are gonna get anyone to say, well, yes. Most people are gonna say, no, of course I wouldn't. And yet they're eating meat and they, uh, or eggs and dairy, and they <clears throat> haven't put the two things together. They haven't looked to see how out of alignment their actions are with their true hearts. And so you can say to them, well, you know, you already have vegan values. You already are homo ahimsa because you don't want to harm animals. And so that helps awaken that, that latent lover within us all that does want to be kind, but has grown up in this, this culture of destruction, really. And um, is just almost in a way waiting for permission to say, you know what, I, I don't want to be part of this destructive culture anymore. I want to be partners with the animals, with nature, with the earth, and with all people and, and create, create a kind world, the world we've, we all dream of. And most of us believe, well, couldn't we create that somehow? Um, one of the things I think is so interesting is that Almost all religions have some version of the golden rule. And that golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, is worded in different ways, but that's basically what it is. Well, how would human beings come up with that all over the world in all the different religions if it weren't our divine heritage our our uh and our highest goal our highest um belief in in who we are and what we can accomplish here on earth and yet we we fall short and the the billions and billions and billions of animals and trillions of fish fishes who are dying in this world is a testimony to the fact that we have fallen way short of the golden rule, not to mention all that we're doing to nature and the earth. So um, it's a matter, the, the good news is that it's a matter of going, oh my goodness, I already am a loving creature. I already have everything I need to create this world, and we all do. So let's get together and do it. A big part of that, of course, is imagining what it would be like because 
we've got one foot in the homo sapiens world of domination and the other foot in homo ahimsa's world of partnership and how do we bridge that gap so i've got all kinds of ideas in the book about that and um one of them is well really i guess some of them more than just one uh, are spiritual in nature because we need a lot of we need to be doing a lot of meditation a lot of inner healing a lot of giving ourselves permission to step outside and and live this new way and express our true nature and that is a a spiritual calling and i think anyone who has has a dream of a better world which is i would say probably just about everybody is being drawn by their spirit in that direction and away from the destruction that's going on so uh but it's um that's so that's one of the steps is is working on your spiritual uh the spiritual aspect of your life and healing within and going within and then also understanding that by visualizing and imagining this wonderful world that we're creating which is a vegan world for sure a non-violent world um that really makes a difference because then we have a picture in our minds of where we're heading. And I think that's really important. So I have one chapter where I kind of just make a long list of what it would be like, um, what this new world would look like. There would not be a, a world government, that's for sure. It would be much more localized, uh, communities having a voice in uh, everything that's going on in the community and um, this this drive to have constant economic growth that would not be going on and that's that's interesting to try to to imagine how that's going to look but it's this drive for constant economic growth to keep the stock prices up and all that that is causing a lot of <clears throat> well that's not the only reason but that's a lot of what's behind all the destruction that's going on and well, we've got to have more acres in uh fields for animals and kill more animals in order to get our stock prices to go up and so all of that has got to change we and we have to reimagine what that's how that's going to work but we the thing that i'm keep focusing on in my book i hope is that for people to feel uh empowered uh, that maybe we don't know how to do that yet but if we get together and brainstorm and have the end vision in in mind we can get there so and and be you know patient with each other and with ourselves there's lots and lots of different ideas out there but um it's it's going to happen it's going to happen from the grassroots up we're going to uh see a lot of i believe a lot of these uh dominator um factions in the world that are trying to create uh, a world government and all of that we're going to see that declining declining and and losing power because human beings are rising up and saying we're going to do this we know how to do it we are homo himsa and so um we have the love that it's going to take to do this and we're not motivated by profit we're motivated by love and that makes all the difference so um do you want me to read a yeah, little bit i um, organize one of your favorite para or a page from the book okay um let's see i was looking at um very introspective um, 
Um, let's see here. Well, I kind of like this one. Um, this is uh, on page 67. Homo ahimsa is a species in love with all miraculous life. <clears throat> and then I quote um, someone named Eleonora Deuce. I just love this. She says, if the sight of the blue skies fills you with joy, if a blade of grass springing up in the fields has power to move you, if the simple things in nature have a message, <clears throat> message you understand, rejoice for your soul is alive. And I just love that. <clears throat> and then I write, <clears throat> our true nature in a word is love. Ahimsa living is love in action. We are meant to be love, to be creatures who love and care for all. Some say we had to go through a quasi-adolescent, self-centered, fearful period of development that led to all of our violent ways. Perhaps so, but that time has passed. We cannot remain there any longer if we hope to survive as a species and heal the damage we've done. This is our big chance to become the loving, nonviolent, compassionate, peaceful creatures we have always been destined to be. Vegan living is the golden rule in perfect action. If we truly desire to live a life of nonviolence, loving kindness, reverence, and compassion for all life, that desire leads us, by definition, straight to the ahimsa life. It is a life-giving way of joy, not a life-taking existence. When we become ethically vegan, we come home to our spiritual and heart essence at last. We become homo ahimsa. So that's, that's page 67. Very well said. <laughs> Thanks. But I do want to say that, that you all um, have known about Ahimsa a lot longer than I have and um, spoken of it, taught about it, and uh, you have really uh, been leading the way for centuries. And I just want to thank you because you are so far ahead of, of the Western idea of hey, let's just own everything and do what we want with it. My, so yeah. you've kept that idea alive and, and it's, it's time. It is time. And it, I feel personally that it is a time, I think, even though we have followed and known the concept of Ahimsa for centuries, but I feel that, uh, as you said in your book, that we are very oblivious of when we say we follow ahimsa, we just thinking that, okay, we're not gonna hurt an animal, but we are so oblivious of thinking that we, by eating dairy uh, unconsciously, we are not following ahimsa. So I really, really appreciate you bringing out this uh, book and, and mentioning that we need to have or create awareness that even by eating dairy or not directly hurting animals, we are promoting uh, non ahimsa, which is the violence. Right. So yeah, I can remember when I finally figured out. I went from vegetarian to vegan. I was vegetarian for oh uh, twenty years or so, and and then suddenly it hit me what was going on with dairy, and I told my mother, "Okay, now <laughs> it's not not just vegetarian. Now I'm going vegan." and and she uh, and I explained <clears throat> that that I wasn't going to drink milk anymore, eat ice cream with her because she loved ice cream. And um, she said, "No, we have to milk the cows; otherwise, they would be in pain." Right. And I thought, "Oh my gosh, that's how I grew up yeah. thinking I was helping the cows, and that's what mom still thinks." And uh, I said but I've learned something new. I've learned what really happens to those cows. And, 
And really all you have to do is think, use logic to think, how are they gonna make those cows have so much milk that there's more than their babies need? And why would a, and then they don't, the babies don't even get any of it. And then why would a human being drink cow's milk? And so, yeah, but I know it goes way back in your culture as far as the sacredness of the cows. And so that's, that's a whole other uh, block, I'll bet, to uh, veganism. I feel that the, the big miss was uh, I think through our centuries that we always, uh, the cows are sacred and we always worship cows, but never realize that uh, drinking dairy or having dairy is violating the same thing. So <laughs> it, is, right. it is good to create this awareness among even, you know, our culture too, which is embedded for centuries. So Dr. Shah, what do you have to say on this? I think the thing is that in the old days, you know, centuries back, our farming industry was really not the best and uh, India was very poor. And at that time, you know, our children needed to grow and they needed enough nutrition. And yes, at that time, cow was the main source of healthy food because the, the farms were literally not doing well. Technology wasn't there and all that. So at that time we had to respect the cows and yes, cows did help us survived through all these centuries but now the things have changed now there are hardly any see any farms where the cows are farming the tractors have replaced and all that so we have to move on and let go of our you know fatal attraction uh, for for the cows it's it's killing them and it's killing us more than anything else so it's time now like mm-hmm. auntie also said that the cow is is a symbol of ultimately us touching our own soul and opening up the world of Ahinsa for us. So uh, it's time now, I agree, you know, so. <laughs> so can you share some of your views, Shining Pai, today? Um... It, the, if you really look at it, the thing is that the Gita was written 2,500 years back. Uh, Krishna uh, spoke Gita to Arjun and everybody argues in, in India that, yeah, all right, yeah, well, Krishna, when he was young, he was consuming curd, yogurt all the time. and so why can't we do the same things? So again, Krishna is so deep seated in our Hindu mythology and all that, but nobody wants to go beyond that. If you, I have read Gita so deeply in the ninth chapter, that is a beautiful slok. And the meaning of that is give me pushpam phalam, pushpam patram phalam troyam, give me fruit, give me flower, give me water and all that. No meat, no dairy products. Now this is spoken by Krishna when he was in the highest state of delivering Gita. So people don't want to hear that. And there is nobody out there to teach them the right thing either. So they keep on following what they want to do anyway. So a lot of things have to change. And if you really look at it, the farming started 23,000 years back. After the farms were started, before that, man used to live in a jungle and there was no way he could have been milking a wild cows. He would not survive himself. He would be thrown out. So after the farm started and the farmer did not want to work, he brought the cows, he tamed them. And then the farmer, the cows started farming the farms and plowing the farms and all little by little cow, farmer says, all right, I'm taking it easy. Let the cow do the job. And oh, by the way, the cow also gives milk. So let's use the milk. Then came the chickens, then, then the sheep and the goats and all those things. All that started with farming industry. And yet there was a time in human history, we did not have farms all the trees were destroyed to create the farm. So there is no reason actually in, uh, I had read up in uh, Discover magazine. So they actually excavated the skeletons and they found the cavities started after the farming started because farming created the carbohydrates because the seeds, which we thought were easy to grow were the wheat and the rice and it's all carbohydrate that's digested by the bacteria that produces the acid, the lactic, uh, the, uh, lactic acid and ultimately damages the staphylococcal bacteria and causes the, the, the cavities. But if you look at the skeletons before 23,000, before the farming, there were no cavities. So we can survive without that. So farming was a destruction. The, whoever invented the farms was the worst mistake of life. And so <laughs> again, so if you really, people want to go back to their gods, which was written in 25, that's nothing. 2,500 years is nothing. Talk about 23,000. 
what the yeah. nature was created we created krishna we created hinduism we created jainism we created christianity those are our creations but we existed who created us the consciousness which was always there created all the animals and we were one of those so we need to respect at that level but that goes a deeper thinking and like judy said meditation is a beautiful beautiful path that takes us deep down at the existential level there is no difference between me and the earth one between me and the ant why won't i do the same thing when the existence created them who am i to take away their existence so it's a beautiful passage uh, of a journey that a world has to go through it's painful but uh, that's how the beautiful joys come out of it so judy has been doing a wonderful job and we all are in the same boat and i really feel feel great to be part of it avinash wait you yes part on your energy judy said that you know she is thankful to us for uh, being aware of ahimsa from a longer time and all that but i feel that uh, i don't see much advantage of being an indian or being raised in india and uh, being actually formally taught about ahimsa from early uh, school years every year you know every year there was a lesson about ahimsa or gandhi or something like that in the textbooks uh ahimsa in india you know is also misinterpreted uh, because of the freedom movement as a non violence against only human beings because gandhi wanted to fight the british without raising arms so that is also an interpretation of ahimsa that they are not fighting uh, or not causing violence against other human being animals are almost totally ignored and i you know i found out ahimsa and uh, veganism at a much later age in my life <laughs> from last 3 4 mm-hmm. years but so <laughs> that, and that is that is that is a re- result of being very focused on ahimsa against fellow human beings not towards animals uh, we never realized that what's going on in the dairy and uh, just like animal agriculture lobbies are uh, governing our diet here uh, uh, religion and the mass brainwashing also uh, controls the diet of indians and india is the largest producer of the dairy largest consumer of the dairy and largest exporter of beef because they cannot kill cows they export them exporter of beef in the world so where is ahimsa in india the uh, the originator of the term and the current holder of the franchise <laughs> so that is my biggest frustration yeah but that's what it is i think uh, i think most of us are like very oblivious we don't know we yeah. have not never introspected that what are our but, practices versus but, but, what are the reason are. but the reason there is a big part of the religious cults uh, in keeping us blindfolded too and they harp on this uh, 2500 year old traditions in our agriculture and our uh, our uh, traditions cultures and everything and our religion Uh, and uh, the worst thing is that the cow is considered a holy animal so <laughs> you cannot hurt a cow but you can just leave it uh, to fend for itself once it is of no use to you and that's why india is a country where cows are uh, stray cows are uh, clogging up the roads no other country has that much uh, uh, problem with this stray cow well then those cows are maybe are lined up starving. for yeah for slaughtering or something right in other countries yeah they are starving mm-hmm. in if it was like uh, some other country the cows yeah. will be sent to the slaughter house and that will be the end of it but in india we cannot legally kill a cow so we just let it uh, fend for itself and eat uh, trash and plastic bags mm-hmm. that is yeah. what, what is happening So, I've read about yeah, unfortunately. that. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the real <laughs> situation, and 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 the cults, uh, religious cults, you know, they are consistently brainwashing people and promising. They are just invoking scriptures and saying that if you light a lamp made with a ghee, your sins will be all washed out on a, on a certain day of the year. You know. Or, and, or, the, or the sacrifices that we uh, we have for yagnas and uh, you yeah. know. 
thing mm. that we do, we have to pour the ghee. Or Everything the from symbolic sacrifices and uh, offerings to God made from dairy to real sacrifices of animals. Like uh, in Nepal, there is a festival mm. where tens of thousands of animals were killed uh, just for sacrifice on a day. And now it has yeah. come down to a few thousand it's from the tent because people have become aware. In uh, South India, uh, there is a festival called Jallikattu where bulls are uh, tortured and uh, made to run around. So it's hard to imagine that Indians can do this and still claim the uh, origin of Ahimsa. I think it is not Indians. I think it is more related to the uh, the religious belief, and I think Hinduism preach about ahimsa. That is how I would relate. To so, it. so I was leading to the uh, I was leading uh, to a question to Judy that uh, Judy is also uh, has created a coalition coalition of uh, uh, religious bodies, and right. they are trying to make uh, uh, religious places vegan. And so I was. Uh, I would. I would request you to tell us about the uh, progress of that, or how it works, and uh, what we can do. Because some of us, some of our donors, and some of our members are on governing bodies of Indian temples. And what we find is that they are being stonewalled by the managements of those temples whenever we mention ahimsa or uh, going vegan. Mm -hmm. So we would like to see uh, what you have. Uh, to tell us about that. Thanks, Avinash. Yeah, it's called the Interfaith Vegan Coalition, and we started it about three or four years ago. Lisa Levinson and Thomas Jackson and I started it, and our idea was to wake the sleeping giant of religion, all different religions, and to, to see that we cannot go on like we are. And that a lot of religions, as you pointed out, um, in, including Hinduism, are um, promoting animal cruelty, but, but covering it up and making it seem like somehow it's okay and it, it benefits the people, so therefore it's all right, which is part of that dominator paradigm that we've been in since, since agriculture started. And um, so our, uh, what we've done is we've created kits, activist kits. And if you go on the website, you can uh, see those kits. And there's uh, a couple of different Hindu kits there that have, uh, well, and, and lots of others. There's some Christian ones and um, uh, there's Buddhist and uh, uh, Zoroastrian, anyway, quite a few. And it basically gives the person who, let's say it's a, a vegan person, goes to our website, they're Hindu, and they want to bring the vegan message to wherever their place of worship is. And so then in this kit, they'll find all kinds of quotes that support veganism from, um, from respected uh, leaders and um, films that they could show, uh, books that they could recommend, yeah, have a book club or something and read, um, all kinds of different things and ideas of uh, if you can't get um, your, say, your, your spiritual leader to go vegan or talk about veganism, then form a little group within your place of worship. And then that little group could gradually bring more and more uh, information in. Uh, maybe even if nothing else, bring in some brochures and lay them out where people could pick them up and, and read them and find out more. Um, and then the idea also of having occasionally, if not every time, vegan potlucks, vegan meals there at the at the place of worship, instead of a big spread full of, you know, other, you know, well, in, in that case, dairy. And um, so there's, that's one thing we're doing. We're meeting once a month with a planning committee 
And one of the things we did recently is we created, I think eight or nine different little two minute videos and we submitted them to the uh, Golden Rule Day, which takes place, I believe in on April 5th and it's 24 hours and it, it goes around the world. So everyone in the world can tune in and, and see, you know, a few clips from the Golden Rule Day or maybe even watch all of it. <laughs> and of course, as you all mentioned, a lot of times people think of the Golden Rule as just applying to people. But so, so we thought it was really important to have some vegan voices in there. And so we've got, I think, like I said, eight little videos that are gonna be on that, that event. So, uh, and we've also been involved with the Association for Global New Thought and, and not all those people are vegan by any means either, uh, but lots of ministers and people like that in that group. And they have actually, we, we kind of made friends with one of the people there who has a little bit of control over what goes on their website. And they uh, took some, some stuff that we wrote about veganism and posted it on their website as part of the season for nonviolence that's that we're in right now. And um, so we're trying to make connections with these spiritual entities, whether it's a, a specific church or temple or broader religion, or whether it's uh, like a multi-faith group and get that vegan message in there. So we're trying different ways to do that. And of course, just like um, reaching all the doctors is important for health, we're trying to reach the leaders. And of course, many times that's going to be through the grassroots, you know, some of the members who are, are going to contact us and say, how do I do this? And, but through that, we can get some connections with some of the leaders. And the more, it's like a domino effect, the more leaders that say, you know what, that does make sense because that is in alignment with our highest values. So yeah, let's talk about that and get their people thinking about it. And I know there's, there's a, a group of vegan genes now that are working really hard uh, and we've we've talked to them quite a bit and working really hard to convince other Janes to uh, why they should eliminate dairy and why that is not ahimsa based and um, so uh, those are the things we're doing we also have a film I don't know if you all have seen a prayer for compassion the film by Thomas Jackson. Yes, actually, we had a screening of that and at a local library. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 It's just wonderful. So that's one of our main tools, really. And we're trying to get as many people around the world to see that film. And of course, right now, it's being seen online, whereas before we were showing it, you know, in lots of different venues at churches and, and various places and getting really good results. Um, we showed it at a unity convention, which is the unity um, religion that's based in Kansas City. They have a convention of their ministers every year. Well, they did until this last year, but um, so I was there a couple of years in a row with a table and um, all the information on our table about the Interfaith Vegan Coalition and how we could help them uh, veganize their churches or at least make them vegan friendly. And our point about the vegan friendly was, you know, think about <clears throat> some of your members who are vegan and you may be talking about animals in a disrespectful way, and you may lose those members if you don't <clears throat> see the connection between kindness 
to animals and people as being the same thing coming from the same heart, the same spirit. And uh, so we, we were able to reach a lot of ministers, I think, with that message of, okay, I understand you don't want to go vegan yourself, but think about the vegans in your congregation. And um, when you have a potluck and it's loaded down, the table's loaded down with meat and dairy, your vegan members are not going to want to come to that. And they may be so saddened by that, that they may not come back. And so it's a, it's a, uh, I think um, they're calling it universal meals. Vegan, vegan meals are universal meals <clears throat> because they, anyone can eat them. And <laughs> whereas meat, not everybody can eat that. And so <clears throat> if you kind of call it that universal meal, anyone can eat it, then you're really being inclusive and uh, so we, we were able to uh, get some of those ideas across. And now, of course, <clears throat> with so many, everything pretty much on Zoom, um, we find we're actually reaching even more people uh, because um, having a physical conference, as you all know, is a lot more involved and you work really hard and then it all happens on that weekend. <laughs> Now it's like we're doing it every day, it seems like. So I think, I think in a way, in a strange sort of way, um, this whole COVID thing is, is creating a, an opening for a, a huge rise in human consciousness. And uh, the amount of information that's coming out on Zoom is just phenomenal. So yeah, and, and this is one of those. And I really appreciate you all. No, I really, really thank you for joining us today and sharing your passionate words and giving us some innovative approach to this whole problem that we all face every single day and we worry about it and we face it with changing the environment. Um, Dr. Shanik Shah, do you have anything to add to this? No, I mean, I really appreciate uh, she's being in the forefront and, uh, and uh, a concept of Ahinsa, which has been kind of relegated down to to the ground really, which is one of the very lofty principle invented by our rishis. They really went down further with introspection and came to a conclusion that we are all connected. And, and uh, like Judy was saying that unless you put that principles in action, it loses its value. Then it becomes a name in the book, something you worship by and that's it. And then you can do whatever you want to do anyway. So uh, we all have to be actors of the Ahinsa. It's a manifestation of your inner self. So I think we all are going in the right direction, Judy, in a very big way. So she can guide us into a lot more avenues uh, which we can take. Yeah, absolutely. I also must thank you, uh, our Nitin Vyas, for introducing you to us, to our organization. Yes. And mm -hmm. I think uh, he passed on words and we are very fortunate to find you through him. Um, I definitely... Thank you, Dr. Shah and Avinash Pai today for joining here and being part of our very um, thought-provoking discussion and looking at different point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Devashi, for handling the Yes, thank you very so well. much. Devashi. Very nicely and done. Actually, <laughs> let us talk about the book. Uh, uh, if anybody wants a signed copy of the books, uh, they can directly get it from the author uh, by contacting uh, her through the website. So let me share that uh, uh, page one second. Thank you, Avinash. And so here is the book and the website, the peace to all beings.com is at the bottom. And anybody who wishes to purchase the book with uh, Judy's signature can go directly there uh, besides Amazon and other outlets. Uh, you won't get the signature from Amazon. <laughs> right. <laughs> you get it only. You'll get it only if you go to the website. Yeah, and I would love to, love to hear from anyone. Yeah, there's a contact me button on the website, and you can just uh, do that and.
tell me you'd like a book. And yeah, it's again www.peacetoallbeing.com. Right. Wonderful. Correct. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Avinash. Appreciate it. Yeah, and among about the book itself, you know, I I'm a late comer to the vegan uh, veganism <laughs> game, and I'm trying to read as much as I can. And uh, I'm very much impressed by Peter Singer, who has uh, clarified things, uh, uh, clarified everything in a very sensible and practical way. And on the other hand, there are books written by activists like uh, Peter Young who have done things in a very practical way to uh, uh, prevent animal abuse. And uh, Judy's book is a third or a, a different uh, concept altogether. It's a thing about uh, what will be, what should we do and how things will should look in the future. So it's a sort of like a science fiction uh, book compared to a novel or a memoir. Uh, if you, if you can take that allegory. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's definitely a book about hope that we yes. really can That's resolve a positive uh, problems. Yeah. Yes, it has a positive outlook. I yes. really wanted yes. to be a part of of empowering people to believe yes. that. You know, don't get discouraged. There's a lot of bad news out there, but we can turn this around and we have what it takes. We have the love in our hearts to do this. And we just have to believe that we have the power to do it. And uh, so I think uh, that's the main reason I wrote, wrote the book. You know, things look bad, but hey, we can do this. So let's get together, yeah. <laughs> wish you all the best for the book and uh, many more to come actually thank you so much <laughs> we'll thank and... you judy thank you thank you all it's been thank wonderful you. being here <laughs>